Fund for Research and Development of Dental Implants from Vision to Clinical Implication, uh, conducted by Professor Ofer Moses. Ofer Moses is a periodontist and professor of Tel Aviv University. So welcome. Ofer, please unmute your microphone. You can start. I think we cannot hear. Um, if uh, Professor Moses, are you uh, listening? Can you please go to the bar and unmute your microphone, please? Thank you. OK. Yes, perfect. Now you see it? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. OK, now you see the main screen, yes? That's right. You can just uh, <laughs> minimize the little screen and we can start. All right. Okay. By the way, how many people are attending? We are currently 37 and we are waiting for more people to join. OK, so <clears throat> Let me start again by saying that uh, when I studied dental implantology, it, the world was very, very mysterious to us because no one really knew what are implants. Today, all the people who deal with uh, implants think they know everything about implants, but most of us should know much about implants. But let me try in this uh, short seminar uh, to show you something which most of us are not exposed to. And uh, the aim of this lecture is uh, to elevate the screen behind many, many things which are as if trivial, but I hope that you will see that they are not so trivial. So let me start with a small uh, theoretical interview between a journalist and a chief executive very important officer of a very successful company. So it goes like this. The journalist asked him, what is the secret of your success? And the CEO answers two words. And the journalist asked, and what are the two words? Then he said, right decision. So the journalists say, how do you make right decisions? The CEO answered one word, which is the journalist asked, then he said, experience. Then the journalist asked, and how do you get experience? The CEO answered two words. Journalist, and what are the two words? And then the CEO answers, wrong decisions. And what I mean by that, that when you are successful in something, you do not you don't know what really are the limits of of, of your success. You don't know when if you uh, go, let's say, two steps to the right, whether you will meet failure or it is still will be successful. So let me just tell you something about the interaction between the manufacturers and the, and the academy, how to give birth to a new implant. So there are different stages in which we go uh, through in order to uh, give to the user, including me, a good, uh, a good implant. So first, we want to design the implant neck, the thread, and the connector design. The second stage, uh, to inflict mechanical lab tests, like fatigue tests, the third item is to analyze the implant surface topography. We have to, to reach a certain roughness. According to the literature, we are looking to numbers and we later on we will uh, touch it. And uh, the fourth stage is to analyze the chemistry of the surface. Does it contain some uh, uh, um, chemical uh, composition that we may jeopardize our uh, hopefully integration? 
Number five, which we will not discuss, is to uh, let the surface with its content to be exposed to a cell, cell culture. The sixth stage is to try to establish a specific reading protocol, and this we do with animal studies. And to summarize all the development stages, we would like to have prospective and retrospective clinical studies in humans. So first, let's see how do we achieve surface roughness. And we are using, main, the, the main technique are using grid blasting of aluminum oxide or titanium oxide or calcium oxide. And we do it by grid blasting, as I said, and uh, followed by double acid etching or some other uh, um, surface is achieved by anodizing instead of grid blasting. And you can see just a moment. Yeah. You can see here a uh, scanning electron microscopy uh, of a surface of an implant that was etched and blasted by with calcium oxide. On the right, you see an acid etched, classical acid etched, and here you see a combination of grid blasting and acid etching. This is a very, very typical photograph of SEM of only etched surface. Remember it. Here you can see the crater. I'm just marking the crater of a heat of a particle, in this case of aluminum oxide, and you see subcraters created by um, acid etching. And this is uh, an atomic frost microscopy uh, demonstration of a very small area, 50 microns over 50 microns, of all the mountains and the valleys of such a surface. And this is an anodizing surface in an electrochemical uh, procedure. We achieve this roughness. By the way, it is very, very difficult to clean. In the industry, it's very difficult to clean such a surface because uh, uh, it's very hard for the clinical procedure, to, for the for cleaning procedure, to get to go into the deep into this area. So, why do we care about a clean implant? Please be patient with me because it might sound stupid, but I hope that at the end of what I will say, you will change maybe your uh, opinion. So, as we said, we achieve roughness by grid blasting, let's say at least in Alpha Bio and many, many other companies, by grid blasting with aluminum oxide. All these black spots that you see here are remaining of aluminum oxide that participated actually in, into the uh, material of the titanium, which is a material that the uh, implants are made of. So we don't like it. And we asked the industry to improve the result. So we go back to them and they try better. And we go back to the electron microscopy and we see all these yellow and circle black spots are aluminum oxide. And we say, sorry, it's not good enough for us. Try better. So we do their best and they send, uh, send it to us. So we increase the magnification of the photographs and we still see this aluminum oxide spots. We don't like it. And they send, we send it back to them. And they said, OK, how about now? Oh, say, well, it looks fine. But you see? still areas of black spots which still have aluminum particles still present and at the end of it it becomes clean so after they establish an industrial meticulous cleaning process we have still things to bother about after we saw that it has no uh, aluminum oxide we go and we make some uh, chemical analysis 
EDS and XPS. EDS is uh, something that you do while you are taking photographs during the same photograph, the scanning electron microscopy, which is a little bit less detailed, and an XPS machine, which will give you all the elements that exist on the surface of the implant. After verifying the composition, we would like to see <clears throat> how rough is the implant. And at the end of it, as we said in vitro, we make a cell culture after we verify that everything is ideal. So this is an EDS, you see, on, with the blue rectangular that this area was analyzed and we see that it has only titanium, I'm sorry, only titanium, oxide, aluminum, and vanadium, which is aluminum vanadium is part of the natural or the bulk of the, of the implant. And we see all the peaks with, that we get in such an analysis. When we want to make a more meticulous analysis, we go to the XPS machine, which is a huge machine. And actually, the principle is that this is the source of electrons coming from an X-ray. They hit the sample. The sample jumps back into a, a, an analyzer. And this analyzer has a library of all the electronic uh, valiants of many, many uh, m uh, um, elements in nature, and he can, and he can by by comparing it, he can tell us what is the this element that we are looking at. And when we do a more meticulous uh, uh, analysis, we see a little bit of carbon in this area. But this is the maximum, and we looked at many many other companies. This is the maximum that we can achieve. We do not want to see nitrogen. Nitrogen means that is this is amino acids, and amino acid is something that the body doesn't like to have coming from outside. So, as I ask, why do we care? A fantastic um, study was done in Israel, made by uh, Karen Shemtom, Yon, Yona, and Danny Rittel. And actually, what they what they did. They retrieved failing implants. And when they went into the scanning electron microscopy, they saw particles, as you see here with this with my laser pointer. This is a particle of embedded aluminum oxide. And here also aluminum oxide. And Danny Rittel had an idea. He inflicted fatigue challenge over the implant and around the um, embedded aluminum oxide, he saw cracks in the aluminum, I, I'm sorry, cracks in the uh, titanium implant. Here also, this is an alum, alum, aluminum oxide and this is a crack. Here also aluminum particles and this is a crack. Crack is not oak is not good. It there is a possibility of detachment of titanium small particle to to jeopardize also integration and the cells that will come to try to swallow it are macrophages which create inflammation and inflammation will lead to loss of integration. So that's why we uh, we would want our implants to be clean of. Uh, aluminum oxide. So the findings were that embedded aluminum particle resulting from the grit blasting process were identified and related to titanium cracks in failed implant. The correlation is that fatigue life and surface damage condition is uh, contributed just because of those um, particles. And the conclusion is that uncontrolled surface roughening by grit blasting induce significant surface damage leading to fatigue cracks and maybe fractures and to implant failure. That's why we want our implants to be clean from aluminum oxide. By the way, it was very, very difficult to persuade people from the industry that aluminum oxide 
is not something that we accept on surface. And it gives them hard time to get rid of those aluminum oxide because due to the high velocity of, the, of those uh, particles of aluminum oxide, part of them are fused to the titanium just because of the high uh, kinetic energy. So, but they manage, which is okay. Now, we have a clean implant and now we want to find a, an optimal drilling protocol. And we think that it is considered a crucial, a crucial role for success. So I ask you, which of the drilling protocol is more, more biological? Aggressive insertion torque and, impl and implant surface roughness? Now, I can tell you that uh, uh, per, per Igbar Brenmark, Professor Brenmark was the man who I studied implants from. I studied in 1985. He passed away in 2014, and I think he deserved Nobel, because, a Nobel Prize because he actually changed the life of millions of people around the world. But the Swedish uh, committee didn't think that he deserved to get it. Anyhow, this is the implant that actually he came to the world with. This is an external hex implant. It's very simple art, very simple implant. It was only machined. It was the not surface draft by nothing. And here you can see the external hex from, from above. Now, what was so special about this implant? The special it was about that only the implant was only inserted with low insertion torque. And it was just because of the special dimension of the implant. In this area, it was 3.75. In the platform onto which the, hex, the external hex was designed, it was smooth. So you had to create a place for it in order to, to allow the implant to get down to the bone, to the line that I'm showing here. You will not be able to insert an implant to this point unless you created a place and we you create a place by using a counter sink by the way victoria can we uh, see that people are all around getting the the the, the lecture victoria yes, people are people are connected yes yes okay so i'll go on i wouldn't like the idea that i'm talking to myself that's it okay so, as I said, that this implant could be inserted to this point unless you use the countersink and using a bone taper was obligatory. You were not allowed to put an implant, a Brennemark implant, inside the bone unless you created the countersink for the, for, for the platform and to tap the bone to allow to screw down the implant with your hands. For him, it was enough. Primary stability was achieved. Anyhow, if you want to use a, an internal hex implant, you can, let's say, if you want to put, to put a 3.75, you can use a countersink of 365 to ease the, 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 the pressure in the cortical or the cervical bone. So, another question is, does implant high insertion torque improve bone to implant contact? I can tell you that before we started the study, I put this uh, question to the, to the group of researchers in our department, and most of them, if not all of them, thought that the higher insertion torque, the better bone to implant contact. Then we decided to design a study Together, together with my colleagues, Dr. Omer Cohen, Dr. Zevo Mianer, Professor Chaim Tal, Danny Otamel from Germany, uh, Professor Weinreb and myself. And we actually challenged the question, uh, what is better for the bone? So what we did, the, the, we intended to measure crystal bone to implant contact when implants were inserted with high insertion torque, 
35 newton centimeter and above, and another protocol, and uh, this is the under drilling protocol, and other implant inserted at low torque, 10 newton centimeters or less, and this we called over drilling group. And the materials mass of, the, of this study was we used 10 New Zealand rabbits. Implants were inserted in two sides, I mean, in two legs, left and right. Um, we created in each limb um, two ostotomies. One, one, uh, I'm sorry, the apical part was 2.8 at the apical portion. And uh, in the crest part, uh, we created the 365 osteotomy. It, actually, it almost was conical. Again, in this area, 365, and in this area where the apical part of the uh, implant enga uh, was engaged, it was 2.8. Now, implants were divided into two groups. Group A, the coronal diameter was 375, and we used a three a 35 till 40 newton centimeters. We called it an under drilling protocol. Again, just to remind you, this the osteotomy diameter in this area was 365, and this was the under drilling protocol. The group B, the over drilling protocol, the diameter of the neck of the implant was 355, and the osteotomy, as I said, was 365. And we used an insertion torque of 10 newton centimeter or less. And uh, this is this photograph actually is a photograph that was taken immediately after completing the surgery. We see the two implants in place. Now the clinical picture before we sutured the tissue above, this is an implant 3.75 diameter. And this is a 355. You see the red halo of the blood, which actually uh, shows us that the implant did not compress the bone. The, we see a little bit of blood in the space between the implant and the bone. And as I said, this is the over drilling protocol. Three weeks after the first surgery, another leg was uh, operated and received two implants in the same fashion. The animals were euthanized after three weeks more, meaning that we have three weeks follow-up and six weeks follow-up. The histology was a non-decalcified histomorphometric analysis. And uh, as I said, the aim was to measure bone-to-implant contact. Now, the, as to the histological results, we see here an under drilling protocol, meaning that the ostotomia was uh, narrower than the diameter of the implant. And on the right, we see an over drilling protocol. You see that this is, by the way, the bluer color means that this is a young bone and this is an old bone. In the, on the left, you see old bone and young bone as well but we see that the bone goes away from the implant. When we look in high magnification of the under drilling protocol, we notice a crack. And this is very typical when we use an under drilling protocol because we want to feel, you know, very good because when the implant is compressing the bone, we think that this is a perfect primary stability, but there is a price for that. We create cracks, as, as we can see very clearly here. And high magnification, you see another crack. By the way, you see the direction of the, of the bone in this area and in this in a stormy way in this area. Something is, the bone doesn't like it. And uh, you see in the under drilling protocol, you see that the bone goes away in this area and this area and this a long crack in this area. The bone is not the same just because we compress it. And we go to the figures. 
you will see that we have almost as twice bone to implant contact after three weeks in an over drilling protocol. Think about it. Now, after six weeks, this is the over drilling protocol. You see quite a good adaptation of the of the bone, still organizing because it's it's bluish. And when you go and look into the under drilling protocol, you see very few areas of contact between the implant, which is the dark area of this photograph, and this is the bone. So this is the under drilling protocol. So this is the under drilling protocol, and this is the over drilling protocol. I think that you have to admit that it took the, the right photograph looks better, meaning that there is a higher drilling, pro, a higher bone to implant contact. And it looks uh, even after six weeks, there is advantage of the over drilling protocol. So the, the conclusion of this small study was that over drilling protocol of the crystal aspect may lead to increased crystal bone to, uh, crystal bone to implant contact and high insertion tongue following under drilling protocol for immediate closing, for example, may risk crystal bone to implant contact. So although it is small study, by the way, it was published, uh, I think it's it has a very, a very clear orientation as why not to use high insertion talk. Now, we are running after the ideal implant surface roughness and there are almost 800 uh, articles talking about the ideal dental implant surface roughness. So we wanted to see what is the influence on the surface of the micro topography of the implant itself. Till now we talked about the bone and we saw that it's bait for the bone. Let, let's, now let's see, does it influence the roughness of the implant? This is a study what, which is a part of the, of the final, uh, final work of our students in Tel Aviv University. Now there are two doctors and two young doctors, Dr. Talia Gurevich, Dr. Yariv Shimon, and the two supervisors were uh, Dr. Zev uh, Omiana and myself. And what we did, we used this disc of bone and we drilled holes in it and we, we inserted the implants. Now, we characterized these two discs uh, of bone, but this on the left side, you can see 127 Hounsfield units it, was, it actually represents high density of the bone. On the right side, you see a disc that have a corticalis in this area and a sponge spot in this area. And the density of the corticalis is 1137, and the middle, the sponge spot is 597. Actually, the, the, this, we use this disc for, for our study. As I said, we drilled. Uh, holes as to osteotomy in, and we inserted the implants, and we checked on the surface roughness of the implant, and we actually asked myself, I asked ourselves, uh, is it stay? Did it stay the same, or it, did it change? And let's see what is our finding. For this analysis, we used a, a nano scan, uh, which is a technique that we can actually take photographs of the surface and give numbers to it. So this is a control, an unused implant, and uh, we measured it and we saw that the average roughness is 2.2, which is a number that repeats itself in the, in the literature as a good surface that will assure good integration. Now, after using 100 Newton centimeters, this is a nano surface scan, and the score is 0.765 micrometer, which means that we lost the roughness. 
we change the roughness. And here we used in another implant 100 newton centimeters, and we have we change the sur the surface roughness to 0.7 microns. And here you can see a very good photographs. As you can see, this area is the area of the thread itself, and this area is the area between the threads. You can see it very clearly on these photographs. In this implant, we used 110 Newton centimeters, and we got we ended up with a roughness of a 0 0.731 micrometer. And the same here, you see this is the outer surface of the of the thread. You see that it is not rough. It is actually as it was faced heat. It was squeezed by the bone surrounding the implant, and this area is the thread, and this area is in between the threads. And it goes on in this area as well. We lost the, the roughness to 0.7. Now, to conclude, to summarize it, we use, by the way, two kinds of implants that AlphaBio is producing. One is the Neo, and the other one is SPI. We uh, checked on it on two diameters of osteotomies, 2.8 and 3.65. And as if we deal to, uh, with the Neo, the Neo we began with about 2.2, and after putting it in a in a osteotomy of 2.8, we ended up we lost roughness to 1.28. When we were used it in 3.65 osteotomy, we lost from 2.2 to 2.08, which is not much, but it's not the same. When we go to the SPI, which is a classical implant that people are using very narrow osteotomy for that, just know what is the price that you pay. So if you put the SPI, a 3.75 SPI into 2.2, 2.8 osteotomy, you go down to 1.25 micrometer, and at 3.65, you go down to 1.52. Later on, I will try to, to, to explain you why is it this way. And the figures actually show uh, what I said before. Both implants are losing roughness, while the SPI is losing more. So the finding is that implant coronal origin uh, surface roughness was modified by the amount of friction during implant installation in vitro. High torque yielded, yielded a decrease in roughness accompanied by a rise in the temperature. The, cl the clinical relevance always look for the minimal torque that ensures good primary stability without changing classical implant surface roughness or jeopardizing, as we saw before, or jeopardizing the bone to implant contact. So if, is, if, the, if the, the, this is the result of high torque that we lose roughness, so why do we talk about so much about the ideal of roughness when, because when we use high torque, we lose the roughness. So maybe as Professor Bronemark thought, that he actually presented to the market uh, many, many years ago, a machine surface without uh, roughening it with grid blasting. So I don't know what is the, uh, what is the correct, the, the optimal answer, but I know that in my implants, I try not to squeeze the bone. And now I know it's, all, it's also for not losing the roughness. Now, another small question how to design the healing abutment. What we did, we uh, made an in vitro comparative study of bacterial growth on grooved and smooth healing abutments. These are my partners, Professor Nunkowski, Nem uh, Levenstein, Hassan Zorbi, Professor uh, Weinreb, and Professor Matalon. We are all acquainted to these two types of healing abutments. One is the grooved one that markates for us one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter, four millimeter, 
<coughs> excuse me, and five millimeter. And on this smooth, on top of it, there is a laser uh, mark that tells us what what is the length of the uh, of this healing abutment. So we try to see is there a difference in the plaque collecting. So what we did, we actually uh, incubated these two types of healing abutment with two kinds of uh, uh, bacteria. One is PG, Porphyromonas gingivalis, and FN, Fusonucleactum bacteria. And you will see what are the results. This is the same photography on both sides. This area, this, this is the smooth part, which is this, the smooth part between the grooves. We call it grooves, okay? And this is the smooth part, which is in between the groove, and this is we are dropping into the groove itself, okay? Here you see very, very small amount of bacteria. This is the, the Fusobacterium nucleatum are elongated rods. And inside the groove, you see a jungle of bacteria. This is again in between the grooves. You see very clearly the teeth of the knife of the CNC. This is the tool that these are, uh, these uh, uh, healing abutments are made. So you see very small amount of bacteria. And we, when we go and look directly into the groove, you see this high number of bacteria inside the groove. So if you look at the figure, this is the number of bacteria within the groove, and there is no difference between the smooth area between the groups and the, uh, the non-marcated uh, smooth healing abutment. Minimum amount of bacteria. This was true for the Fusobacterium nucleatum, or let's call it FN. Now, the other bacteria, the PG, it, the picture is very similar. This area is the in-between the groove, the smooth surface, and this, this area is the area that move, move you from the in-between in groove going inside the groove. This is, again, this, this is the in-between groove. You see very seldom, very small amount of this small bacteria and the beginning of collecto, collecting collected bacteria inside the group, and you will see directly, look what happens inside the groove itself. Huge amount of bacteria. And the figure is also the same. This is number of bacteria uh, within the groove, and this is in between the groove and on the smooth healing uh, abutment. And of course, when we deal with prosthetic parts, and imp the, the implant itself is a prosthetic part, although buried, it's not. It's an artificial. I'm sorry. It's an artificial part. We do not like to have high number of bacteria on the artificial part. So, surface morphology may promote or delay plaque accumulation, as we saw. But it's not surprising because it was found by many, many other people before us. And surface, the rough surface collect about 25 times more plaque than machine surface. And I can tell you that we at the University of Tel Aviv influence Al AlphaBio to leave the marcated healing abutment and to stick only with the smooth part because they saw that it collects less, a uh, lower number of bacteria. That's, that's actually, this is our job as academy to try to influence, uh, of course, when we have some uh, real uh, correct facts to, to, to bring to them. And this how the way we actually we, uh, establish uh, some kind of a dialogue with the, with the companies. Now, something which is this study actually that you see here uh, was done 
Um, and, the, and the title is The Histological Examination of Bone Around Experimental Alpha Biotech Implant Neck Design Evaluated in Mini Pigs. I can tell you that this study was designed in order to choose the correct uh, neck design of Neo. What you all know now is with the two flutes, I will just show you what was the way to Neo. So we use a 3.75 diameter implants, and we, uh, as I said, we made it in a single mini pig model, Calvaria, and uh, we prepared for to, to inserting the implant. We prepared first was a 1.2 millimeter uh, drilling guide, went on to the two millimeter drill, 2.8 millimeter, 3.2 with a cortical release of 3.65 uh, millimeter. And uh, we let, with the, during surgery, we let the implants to heal for one month, and then we collected the histology. These are the four types of implants that were examined. Uh, we divided the calvaria into right side and left side. In each side was in a row. One, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four. And what kind of implant you see here? This implant has six flutes. This also had six flutes. This, this had no flute. And this, as, as, as you know, very similar to the uh, Neo, had two flutes. This flute began about one third of millimeter from the lips or for the corona part of the implant, and here the fluid begins about 1.3 millimeter. As I said, we let the animal heal for one month, and then we collected the histology. You see histology of an implant 3.75 with micro rings. You see here, these are the micro rings of the implant. This is the implant body. And you see here the dark velvet color, which resembles a new bone. A more, a less uh, velvet, which is pink, is the old bone. You see that the bone reacts, it reacts to the presence of the implant. We made a hole here, and the bone actually organizes itself not only intimately with intimate contact, but a little bit far away from the contact area with the implant. And this is magnification one of this implant, and this is magnification 100. Here you see an histology of nail, what, what later on was called nail. An, an, an implant with two flutes. Here is the line of osteotomy. This is the flute area, and this is the flute area, as you can see. Going back to the nail, you see in more detail the histology. You see this small tooth or small thread. This is location in the real and in the, in the real implant in this area as, as i said this is old bone and this is new bone why do i say it because this is the line of the osteotomy the white line and here you can see a perfect adaptation of the new bone and this is a cross sectional to show again a very very good adaptation actually closes everything, every space between the bone and the implant, the bone actually compresses the implant. The healing actually, uh, yes, come in a very intimate contact to the, to, the, uh, to the implant. Now, just to remind you, we had four types of implants, 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A. And you can see it on the histogram. I do not want just to bother you. Look at this uh, velvet color. This resembles 
the bone around the uh, type 4A, and here again, the, this color resembled the what came out to be neo. So actually, neo was found to to result in the best BAC in the coronal part. And what we say, this is the winning design. Actually, this is this laid the base for the decision to to implement two flutes in the neck of 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 the of the nail because it gives us the best coronal uh, coronal um, result, the best BAC. So this is uh, actually a, an example of how does a, a, a company that respects its users to check every feature on an implant that it sells to the market. And I can tell you that, and I'm, I feel very uh, uh, happy about uh, that this company was opened to our suggestion and was uh, open to check itself. Not all the companies are the, this way. They bless the implant to the market, and uh, like we say, it's like the banana principle. They sell us a green banana, which means a new implant, and it let it they let it mature in our hands. It means that when you go and buy a green banana, you let it stay at home and becomes yellow, then you eat it. And when I say the, the banana principle means that companies, not all of them, but some companies sell us an unmature, uh, unmature uh, device, and we learn from from our own experience, and we come uh, to them with suggestions. So I can tell you that this company uh, that does not belong to me uh, is open to check itself because it before it goes to the market, and I think it's 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 a good advantage. Now. Let me uh, talk a little bit about conical connection versus straight hexagon, as we all know. Now, let me just give you a sketch that was supplied me by the company. This is this is the abutment, and this resembles the implant, and this is the internal hex of the implant. You should know that when you tighten the screw of the abutment into the implant, the overlap area, the support area that this abutment is getting from the internal hex is about 3.3.5, uh, 3.35 millimeter square, which is not much. Now, when we check, when you check on the conical connection and the conical abutment that goes into the conical hex of the implant, the overlap area is 11 millimeter square. So what do we, why, why do we care? We do care because all the effort when the, our patient is biting on the crown that sits over this, imp, over this abutment, all these forces actually is working in this area. And when the uh, surface of contact between the hex and the abutment is large, it means that each millimeter of an implant is actually bearing less and less pressure, which will ensure higher life without uh, any mechanical problem. And also, because the support is so uh, big and there is less micro movements. Micro movements, according to the literature, will influence bone loss and maybe will expose the implant to more fractures. We all know what is flowering of an internal hex. Flowering of internal hex means that the hex, the upper part of the hex is broken. So the chances for, for breaking an internal hex are much bigger than a conical connection, and this is the explanation. The overlap area in a conical connection is one is 11 millimeter, while in the in the um, internal hex is only uh, 3.25. Almost one quarter of it 
which is not uh, enough. So what we did, this is the, uh, according to the mechanical problem. What we did uh, together with the Italian group, uh, leading by uh, Dr. Luigi Canulo and myself, uh, we did a study and we what we did, clinical and radiographic outcomes of implants with the same morphology, a different connection, a randomized controlled study. And what we did, we, we uh, actually measured bone level changes around two implants. We used exactly the same implant, but with two different internal connections. One was a normal hex that we all know, and the other one was a conical hex. Okay. Let me just show you. This is the conical hex with a typical connector of a conical hex that goes till this area into the implant. And this is the typical uh, uh, internal hex. The same, the implant were actually looked, I mean, it's the same implant. The only difference was the internal connector, conical versus a, a control a normal hex. We used 33 patients and uh, the patient were randomly assigned to conical connection and to normal hexagon uh, connector. The implant that was chosen for it was a neo hex. And uh, like Luigi, like in the prosthetic time, when, when the, the time of prosthetic arrived, one abutment one time means that after taking the impression, an abutment was connected and never released. And we all know why. Guided surgery, guided surgery was used. As you can see, I'm not going to stay to to stay too much about uh, surgery because this is it's not a seminar talking about uh, surgical technique. Although for clinician, it's a it's a good time to look how other are working. And just to summarize, before I show you the results, 34 implants having the, uh, the conical connection, 26 in the upper jaw, eight in the lower jaw, and the internal hex connector, we use again 34 implants, 27 in the upper jaw, and seven in the lower jaw. Again, no big deal. Just to show you that um, the stability of the implant was measured by an Ostel device. This is a smart, uh, smart peg, which is screwed into the implant. And with this uh, edge, we are measuring the stability, the axial stability of the implant. So the score here, we show about 57. Let's see what happens to it when we go to second surgery. Second surgery was done eight weeks in the lower jaw and 12 weeks after insertion in the upper jaw. And here we measured in the hostel 72, uh, 72 uh, on the scale of the hostel. As to the radiological analysis, we measure it uh, from the internal shoulder, and we actually uh, measured it after six months and 12 months. And the, the results were that we didn't lose any implant, and there were significant differences in the margin, bon, marginal bone loss between the connection at six months and 12 months. We saw the improvement in the ISQ measurement. It improved, it means the stability of the implant improved with time. And the, we had um, a minimum bone loss 
in the connect in the conical connection a little bit more in the uh, in the normal hex. We all know from the literature that we lose more bone around, uh, although in, not in a high degree, but we lose uh, bone more in the internal hex and in the conical connection than in the conical connection, and we prove it uh, uh, in this study as well. By the way, this study was uh, accepted for publication last week in the International Journal of Oral Implantology. This is due to the uh, this skillful researcher Luigi Canulo. Now let me just just um, Victoria, how much money, Charlie? Victoria. Yeah. Okay. Let me just talk a little bit about. Uh, I I may say a secret project that is held now in Alpha Bio. But uh, since I'm part of it, I'm uh, allowing myself at the maximum people will take the I take the chance. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about nanohydrophilic surface. This actually in high magnification how nanostructures look like. Okay. And by the way, this is a neo implant that this, the, the, the talented engineers that are working in Alpha Bio are actually define the process in, into which they can come again and again and again to the same result, which is very, very difficult uh, to, to create in a, in a, in a in the industry. This is not a scientific uh, factory, but still it have to meet scientific standards. So what you see here in this red rectangle, this is this area. And look, this is the nanostructure and this area is another area. You see a very similar nanostructure it means uh, that all along the implant, you have the same uniform, uh, the same uniform nanoscan, I mean nanostructures. It's very important. And this is uh, this map, actually the atomic force microscopy map to show how does it look on the AFM. This is the, on a nano scan. You see this uh, scale is from zero to 3. Uh, 350 nanometers. It, it's, a very, it's a very small field. It's very uh, difficult to accept such, uh, such a photograph. For you, it's very trivial. You see it, but in order to achieve it, a lot of uh, done in order to achieve it. And here you can see this is a, a grid blasted surface. A peak, and this is a peak, and this is the valley between the peak. This is a, achieved by a grid blast and etching. Now go to the right. You see how peaks and sub valleys you have on the same same length. This is the very typical to a nano nanoscale surface roughness. So the question is, why to bother? Why do bother just because other people do it? Now there is a good explanation why to try to make the, your best in order to achieve it. Because according to science, we have very good reasons why to insist to develop it. And let me just go a little bit into details. There is a very good study done by Jenison, and he was uh, uh, looking at macrophages. Macrophages are the first cells to approach the dental the dental implant surface after we suture the implant at uh, the suture of the soft tissue above. Actually, this cell is the garbage cleaner. He goes and clean the implant and in order to do, to do it, it creates inflammation. And inflammation, sometimes it's good for bone uh, creation and sometimes it's bad. And let's see what is the influence of such, uh, of such uh, a surface. If we compare a no, a no nanostructure surface to a nanostructure, we see 
more osteoid, which is more newborn, compared to a no, almost double. Newborn and nano structure compared to the no, no structure. And we have bone ingrowth, which is 0 0.7, 0 0.07 uh, in a percentage, and almost seven times or eight times more more new bone growth on a nanostructure surface. And this is due to the macrophage because the, the macrophages have several subpopulation, the M1, M2, M3, and M4. I will talk only about why M1 and M2. M1 is a subtype that will excrete uh, inflammatory cytokines. And M2 is able to excrete BMP2, which is crucial to evoke uh, osteogenesis, and VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which actually uh, is the factor that develops uh, vascularity. So the combination of BMP2, which is new bone, and vascularity, actually, this is a combination which is responsible for the previous slide, I'll show you again that we have more bone and more bone in a nanostructure surface compared to the regular implant that we are used to look at it. Another study that checked on the role of nanotopography of titanium implants on also integration. Very, very important. On the black, you see the nanostructure. On the right, you see machined. And if you look what happens after three days after you put a titanium implant into bone, you see a lot of inflammation. TNF-alpha is a very strong inflammatory cytokine. And here in the nanosurface, very low amount. It means the inflammation is very, very weak compared to the a machine structure, and it goes along 28 days, something else happened, but the differences are very, very weak because the body cannot live without inflammation, actually. Now, RANX2 is another uh, trans transcription factor which is associated with osteoblast. We see here that after six days in machine, we see a comp comp kind of compensation, but after 28 days, we see more and more <clears throat> factors which actually uh, causes osteoblast differentiation. Very, very important. And if we look and we count monocytes and macrophages, we see that in machine surface, we have much more, almost, almost three times or two and a half times more in the machine surface compared to the nano surface. And another factor called periostine, which is osteoblast specific factor, we see huge amounts of these factors influencing osteoblast to function after three days. This is the, this is the nano surface and this is the machine surface. Now, let me just more complicate you. As you see all around, we have much more advantage, not only because of the nanostructure, but also because of hydrophilic. Hydrophilic, the combination of hydrophilic and nanostructure is a winning composition. And just let me, I'm sorry, just let me finish this part. My part is something that which is taking for Albert Einstein. And he said that when you look deep into nature, and then you will understand everything better. So if you want to understand your profession better, you cannot not look into the small details of, let we, as we said, molecules, what happens when we compress bone, we lose PIC, and we jeopardize the roughness that, 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 that the companies are selling us. And I want to thank you for your participation.